Who was here for the last presentation? Yay, so you had, a, you had it's like you needed to come for part two. What is he really going to talk about that stuff? Um, yeah, because the the first the first presentation I did or the, uh, before lunch was was about the anatomy of an ISP, and um, so what I've done now is I've taken out some of those slides because I'm lazy and duplicated them here. So it's great for those people that have just joined us. Um, for those people that have seen it already, um, well, just don't fall asleep. Um, yeah, so, so I'm going to focus more on um, the border of an ISP network. And uh, let's just start anywhere. So those uh, that were in the last presentation, uh, this is how a cat picture gets from the home, you know, all the way through the ISP network, gets served from the CDN server, and comes back to the user. And um, this is the particular, so I was speaking about this as a whole in the last presentation. I'm going to talk about that over there, all right, and, and how we interconnect with the world. Uh, who runs an ISP or works for an ISP here? Okay. Um, so, your, your mileage may vary about exactly the way that you have your deployment or going to be doing your deployment. But generally speaking, um, the, you have your internal ISP network, which is running OSPF, and then from your core routers, um, you might be getting your routes via IBGP. You have the edge of your network uh, where your customers uh, connect, whether they be point-to-point -point static links or PPPoE or whatever the case may be because this is where you are feeding your customer internet from, right? Then you have your core routers um, that will be connecting to your upstreams over here. Um, this should actually be upstream transit. And if you have multiple upstreams, you probably or may have full routing tables. Full routing table these days is over 700,000. I think it was 700 and... Yeah, someone was worried about a one of those Y2K things. Um, 768 was it? They were worried about seven, 768,000 routes and you know memory issue. So if you are going to be ingesting those, you would ingest those onto your core routers, and maybe have a default pointing out to your transit, um, or or not. But more than likely have a default. If you can't find anything, then go out to your upstream. Then you have peering routers. Now, a lot of smaller ISPs, they can't afford to have two routers here and two routers here, so they collapse them and do them all together. The reason why you want to have peering on separate routers, number one, um, as you'll see later, peering and traffic across IXs are a lot bigger than coming through your transit links, okay? So in terms of traffic volume. And then number two, from a safety perspective, you do not want to have a default route on your peering routers. The reason for that is um, the ISP, probably the same guy, I don't know, but that, that was sending traffic across his, his uh, enemy's network, would point a default route, a static default route on their network across the exchange to your IP address to get a default route. So they would be able to go from the one side of the exchange, you know, sitting over here, they would point a default route to the, your router over here and then route through your network. Yep, highly possible to do. Okay. So for those people that don't know, where do I get internet from if you are building an ISP? There's transit or upstreams, there's many of them um, in South Africa, Work Online and Seacom, uh, WIOC. These guys are um, generally more expensive than your peering, and um, they are your gateway of last resort. And in theory, it should be only international traffic, because we have very good exchange points in South Africa, and um, anything that is on this, in this country, I was going to say on the continent, but that's very wrong, um, because the peering in Africa is terrible. Uh, you'll find that even our, um, our neighbors uh, will go all the way up to Europe, uh, cross peering in Europe, and come all the way back down to South Africa. 
even though it's so close. I've got a whole other presentation on that if you want. <laughs> part three. Um, yeah, so um, for the most part, you should be getting your peering, your, uh, your traffic locally um, from an exchange point. In South Africa, there are two exchange operators. They both operate in uh, all three of the major regions. Uh, Inc. ZA is, um, is run by itself, uh, but it it's, uh, sits under the ISPA. Um, they are all multi-site, which means that, for example, I know the Durban uh, very well. There's a switch in IS. There's a switch in Terraco. They do the backhaul between the two switches. So if you have... Um, presence in IS, you can peer at the exchange at IS, and you'll pick up all the peers that are peering in Terraco. All right, so that's a multi-site exchange. It's the same in Joburg and Cape Town where they have, I think, uh, Joburg, I should actually know these things being co-opted onto their technical committee, uh, but I think four sites in Joburg and all the liquid data centers um, and uh, Hetzner, etc. I know they're all changing their names these days, aren't they? <laughs> And then you have NAP Africa. Uh, it's free for Terraco customers, um, Joburg, Cape Town, and Durban. Peering um, across an exchange is super cheap, uh, relatively speaking, to, um, uh, to transit. We have a bit of a, a, a problem in South Africa where uh, Terraco has created a um, false economy because people think, in, as a running a, a South African ISP, that peering is free. Okay, you go to any other market in the world, um, or almost any other market, you will be paying for those ports. Uh, some of them quite expensive, but cheaper than transit. And then you have all your big CDNs uh, connecting to your exchange points like um, uh, Google, which is uh, mostly YouTube, uh, Limelight, Netflix, um, Microsoft with, um, well, Azure is, is separately you normally on-ramp to Azure through a direct connection, but uh, your Office 365, etc. So, when do you connect to an IXP? And if you do, who do you connect with? And it, so it sounds like a strange question, but you don't always go, right, I'm running an ISP, let me connect to the exchange point. Because you might not be uh, in one of those data centers where there's an exchange point. And if it's going to cost you, so let's say, for example, you are running an ISP in Bloemfontein, um, you have to normally get layer two all the way from Bloemfontein to, to Durban or, or, or Joburg, um, and then you pay for the costs of the port and you know cross-connects and whatever the case may be. That might actually work out to be, for the amount of traffic that you're using, more expensive than just paying your current upstream um, and, and speaking to them and saying to them, come, give me a better deal here. You know, I'm not going to connect to the exchange. When you connect to the exchange, you have all these CDNs on net, um, if they're a big supplier, um, if they're a big carrier. So, you know, give me a decent price. Um, the question I get asked my of most often, should I connect to both of the IXPs? If you can, yes. It's like, should I have two links out of my network, yes, you should. Right? The other reason is, is that, so if something happens to the IXP, um, you are backed up by the other IXP. And then also different IXPs have different uh, ASs on them. And so then you'll pick up different networks on different, um, on different exchange points. Um, so what do you do once you've connected your cable into this, the switch? All right, so an IX is really a switch. It's a layer two um, domain, and um, you have all these people plugging into the switch. The first thing you probably want to do is set up BGP sessions to the peering root servers uh, and peer with the root servers. Most of the other guys do that. So it's an easy way of connecting to most of the other networks on the exchange with doing the least amount of work. Me being lazy, that would be the way that I would do it, all right? Um, and then what you do after that is, and, and this also comes back to the point about IXPs and, and, and connecting to, to, to an exchange point, is that setting up BGV peering sessions, managing them, managing your routes, costs money actually at the end of the day, costs resources. So then you set up your sessions with your most important peers, and some of those 
only send traffic to you if you peer with them directly. Cloudflare is one of them. Um, who knows Cloudflare? Okay, if you don't know Cloudflare, you know My Broadband? Cloudflare hosts My Broadband. So if you want to get there um, on your own network without going up transit, you should have to set up a bilateral session with them. All right. And then, um, uh, should you set up bilateral sessions with people? Probably, if you can. All right. So this shows you the economics of peering and why if you are running, you know, a f uh, fair size network and you will, you will have more and more traffic as you go along, this is why you want to peer. So this particular graph shows the blue, which is all the um, exchange traffic on a particular ISP, and then it shows the red, which is transit. And I think the most important thing here is, on average, 25% of the traffic is transit, only 25%, all right? So um, if, your, uh, if, if your connection to the exchange is relatively cheap, it brings down your costs a lot, all right? The other interesting thing is you see these peaks at the end of each day, all right? Guesses? It's actually later than that, but it's, yeah, 6 to 10. What is it? Netflix. Netflix. Okay. Think about this, is that if you have a transit link, all right, let's say, for example, you have a one gig transit link, and average during the day you're running at six, seven hundred megs, and then in the evening you do an extra 50% of your traffic. You're going to 1.1, 1.2 gigs just for those few hours. And now you have to up your transit cost. You have to go do an upgrade with your transit provider to get uh, to deal with those peaks. So by connecting to the exchange, you then help to offload those peaks so that you don't have to worry about upgrading capacity, more expensive capacity to deal with those, with those peaks. All right, so the other thing you have to remember, so this, this particular thing is, is showing um, uh, traffic per exchange point or per link into exchange point on, on that same network. So you can see here, it's, uh, the, the color's not great, but over here, this is a pretty big um, you know, link. Uh, it uses a lot of traffic, it brings in a lot of traffic. Think about this with your network. What happens if that link gets taken out of service for whatever reason? What's going to happen to your traffic? Where is it going to come from? You have to route it over your other Correct. So you either need to route it over your transit, or you need to route it over your other exchange points. Okay. So what you have to remember, and what I'm kind of getting at, is when you're building your network and you, 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 you are um, thinking of and planning the edge of your network, if a link fails, where will the traffic go to? Those links, can they deal with that traffic? Those routers, can they deal with the traffic? So going back to my first slide where, or whatever it was, where I had peering routers and transit routers, if you had to take the peering routers out, can the interfaces into the, the, the core routers deal with all this traffic that's coming in all of a sudden via transit? Do you have enough transit you know, to deal with those? Mm -hmm. um, while we were talking here, I pulled up a slide. Um, Anyone know what those peaks are? Rugby matches. Yes. We had that as well on Friday. Yeah. So that was like something else. Um, this was from a cache um, in Durban where we, all of a sudden we were like looking at these peaks and going, what the hell is this thing over here? But that was, that was just, I just added that in for fun. But again, comes to this thing of peaks. You know, if, um, if you... Uh, can pick up content across an exchange rather than going via transit to deal with those peaks. Good for you. Right. Um, I'm not going to bore you with this slide because many of you have sat through this slide and I said wait until part two. Right. Um, do you want me to go through this slide? Yes. Okay. I think what's most important for this, okay, is that you have things called uh, RIRs. In, the, in our case, it's Afrinic, where you get external um, resources, uh, uh, your autonomous system number, and your IPv4 and v6 blocks. From there, you have to create IRR objects, and this is what I'm going to go into a little bit now. Um, and let me, well, let me expand on it. 
these are our objects. You have different objects. And these objects are like, um, not that I do programming, but programming objects where they link to each other so that you can reference one object to another object. Um, in the case of a root object, which is the definition of a, um, of, of a IP prefix, like for example a slash 24, it's, it's given an object name so that other people can um, query the database and get information about that object. So that root object will belong to an AS, all right? AS sets will belong to an AS, organizations, people, they interlink to each other. I think that's the most important thing to understand here. And what you need to do is you need to put them into the Afrinic database and you need to keep them up to date. All right, that's important stuff. So, a root object. I'm um, picking on CCOM, although I don't know why they should get uh, after, uh, maybe it's they were front of mind because of all the publicity they've been getting over the last couple of weeks. Um, but CCOM, I pinged their websites, I did a who is on their IP address, and it came up with this particular root object. And this root object, it summarizes that in a slash 12, tells you that it originates from that autonomous, uh, aut <laughs> AS, <laughs> um, and that is an object. So that will refer to the AS object. So with the AS object, um, it tells you about the AS number, the organization, um, and what's quite interesting about CCOMs is that they use, in their AS object, they use the import and export. These things over here are used to build their root filters. Um, it's publicly available to have a look at, to see what they're doing. Um, it's, it's actually a good thing because then you can understand as a customer, if you are a customer, um, what they're doing to your traffic or how they're getting traffic into the, into the network. And then you have um, an AS set number um, and the relevance of these particular objects that I'm choosing is how you build root filters to uh, protect your um, prefixes that you're receiving from people. And what's most important here is the members that you have. So if you have an AS set, you will typically have your customers, okay, as members, their AS, their AS numbers or their AS sets in, or their AS numbers in, um, in the member list. And what that means is that when I build a root filter, I choose an AS set object, and that will include all of these guys over here. So it includes all their customers. So that I know when I'm accepting prefixes from somebody, that those are allowed to be accepted, not just prefixes or, or um, IRR object, root objects that belong to CCOM, but belong to their customers as well. So we need to get ready to uh, get these resources. Once you've got these resources, create the IRR objects into the database. Um, and I me mentioned it very briefly um, in the previous talk was rowers. Uh, um, rowers are cryptographically signed um, IP addresses originating out of a specific AS. Just to go back with the IR obje objects and why it is critical that you deploy, that you have these up to date, is that if you have a network and you are going to be peering with Google, Google will now start filtering, um, I'm not sure whether it's early next year or later this year, by IRR objects. In other words, if that IP address does not have an IRR object in any of the IRR databases, you simply will not be able to get traffic directly from them. And then it goes via transit or maybe not even at all. Um, with the rowers, rowers are um, basically the source of all truth when it comes to your prefixes. So if you are serious about your network, you're serious about those resources that are damn expensive, all right, they're really expensive, um, then you want to make sure that everybody else out there knows that it originates from your AS and no one can hijack them. All right. Then the next thing you want to do is create a peering DB account, and I'm going to move on to that um, in the next slide just to explain that a little bit. 
And as I said before, plan. Plan your network, plan how you're going to connect the edge of your network, which IXs you're connecting to, your transit, how you're going to be advertising your prefixes out. Um, it's all about planning. And then once you've done your plan, then you can implement it. Right? And then you want to create your outbound filters. And those are quite straightforward. You only want to advertise the prefixes that belong to you and your customers. Right? You have no reason to send anything else out of your peering, your BGP peering sessions. All right? No um, bogons, you know, uh, 192 addresses, um, no, no other routes. There's no reason to whatsoever. Right, so just back on the peering DB, um, there's the websites up there. If you have an AS, you must have one of these. Okay? Because when you request a session to set up a session with Microsoft, Google, Cloudflare, all the big CDNs, they use the information on here. So the information on here needs to be correct. Right? Um, things that people look for is your AS set name. Remember I was speaking about the AS set? and you know, what's, what's relevant to you. And so in other words, you're gonna build a filter and accept stuff from me, that's where you look at. And then the next important thing is how many prefixes do you plan on sending out your session? Right, so, um, and, then, and then the next important thing is which of the exchanges do you connect to? Because they will automate the setup, and they'll say, right, these are the IP addresses that we're going to set up the, the, the peering session for. Right, and then you've got to create inbound filters. Depends how lazy you are. Okay? <laughs> Me? <laughs> Set them up. Okay. Um, the absolute minimum that you want to do um, is make sure that you have max prefixes. And that was at the bottom of my list, but I just want to... Before, before people fall asleep. <laughs> um, but if, if you're going to do anything, go to peering DB, people that you're peering with, and say, how many prefixes am, am I expecting from you? Okay. Let's say, for example, I'm peering with somebody, and I look at their peering DB profile, and they are going to send me, they say, one prefix. I say, great, max prefix, one. So if you send me any more than that, I'm going to shut down my session straight away because you are either leaking a full routing table to me and that's going to cause havoc with me. Um, and I've had that before with, um, and I won't name and shame because I think they're a sponsor <laughs> um, to us. And then, um, but, so, so, but what's important with that is that if you have, for example, a slash 23 and you decide to break that up and to send two slash 24s, you immediately are now sending a max prefix of two. You must update your peering DB profile to say you're sending two. All right? It doesn't have to be exact. So you, in other words, if you have a slash 21, you might want to say 10. All right. So deny bogons. Those are, um, if you want to automate that, there's bogon feeds. You can put a community onto that, tag it, and say these are bogons, add it to a filter. So anything coming in, you deny 192.168. 10 dot whatever, you deny those. No reason why you should be getting your own prefixes on your routing, on your sessions from somebody else. Okay, they belong to you. All right, so deny those. The next thing you want to do is if you have customers, you don't want your customers to be sending new traffic via the cheap ex exchange links. So deny your, your customer prefixes on, on all your um, uh, sessions because the only way that you want to uh, get traffic from them is via that link that they paid for to come to you, right? And then you start building your filter lists on IRRs and ROAs. I'm just going to um, briefly go into building prefix lists with um, IRRs. And then there's something called AS path filtering. AS path filtering, um, you will know the AS paths of your uh, BGP here, as well as their customers as well. And then as I said, as if you want to do just one thing, or you must do at least one thing, just set max prefixes. Okay. So what's the first thing you do? You must? Thank you. Okay. So there's a tool called BGP Q3. 
Um, and what you can do is create um, prefix filters from that. So in the case of uh, uh, Cisco speak, um, this particular thing takes the AS set uh, 37172 and builds a prefix list, my prefix list. And what it does there is it permits those specific things that were brought up from the Whois database, from that IR database. It built it from that database. So if this particular um, ISP didn't have those in there, wouldn't be put into there, wouldn't be accepted. Right. And then um, on the case of Juniper, uh, you can put a, um, uh, you can output to that. Ultimately, what you want to do is have something that will run every 24 hours or whatever the case is to rebuild all these prefix filter lists. I was doing this with a customer. Um, I um, then said, I'm uh, choosing to actually do two separate things. One, for smaller ISPs to build prefix lists, the Googles of the world, max prefix only. But then there were the standard Denar Bogons, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. My favorite topic, not. Okay, but I have to put it in here, right? Mars, manners, men from Mars, manners. Um, manners, um, mutually agreed norms for routing security, you can find them there. What they do is um, they have a list of things that are best practice. There's been best practices, they're called BCP, BCP38. Um, it's been out there forever, but ISOC, they decided that they wanted to you know, write their own thing and start their own program. I think it is good because um, it makes the internet a better place, right? Uh, but my issue with it is that you should already be doing this. It's like everybody should have good manners. You don't need to have a certificate to say that you have good manners. But sometimes it might be nice, actually, yeah? <laughs> All right. So not in manners speak, but in my speak, okay? They, uh, manners has four points as an ISP that you want to uh, do. Egress prefix filtering, which I spoke about. Ingress prefix filtering. And then making sure that all your stuff is up to date, that you've created AS objects, um, kept your who is up to date, peering DB, um, you know, kept the, all those things up to date. So if you've done all the things that I've told you in the slides, then you should be able to go to Manners, sign up, get a t-shirt, and be really cool. Right. How much time do we have left? Ten minutes. Um, I added in a very short section. Are there any questions with that? You want to know something? You know everything. Don't know anything. I bored you. Yes, <laughs> I have. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so, I, I mean, I didn't know how much into BGP peering and past selection, but since we've got 10 minutes, I can bore you some more. All right. So, um, this was a talk I did at KZN NOG uh, a while back, and I'm going to really, really summarize it. But basically, when I talk about inbound and outbound, I'm talking about from my network to your network, okay? So, traffic coming in from you to me is inbound for me, all right? Traffic going out from me to you is outbound. Okay, so the same thing would apply there, but the reverse is opposite. <laughs> so the reverse is true, where outbound for you will be inbound for me. Okay, everybody get that concept. Okay, so we're going to talk about ingress and egress. Now, BGP path selection algorithm is super complicated. You can see there's all sorts of things there. The ones that we're really worried about and that I'm going to speak about are the three that are on bold. Okay? And the most specific route always wins, hands down. Okay? That's the trump card. What that means is if, if you receive a slash 24 from somebody, all right, that will beat a slash 23. And a slash 23 beats a slash 22, and so it goes on. Then you have something called local preference when you're receiving prefixes from a, um, uh, from a BGP peer. And you set that local preference on your network. 
All right? So you're in control of that local preference. In the case of local preference, it's opposite to the OSPF, where the higher, the better. So you prefer something with a higher number. Okay? Maybe you prefer a paycheck with higher numbers on it. Um, and then if something is equal when it comes to both the prefix length as well as the, um, the local preference, then it looks at the shortest AS path. If all those are equal, it generally speaking, it looks at which one's been in the routing table for longer on your side. Okay? This is all from within your network. Okay? So what you're looking at is all the, uh, from the different peering sessions, so from your transit, from your um, IXP1, IXP2, you have all these prefixes that come into you that have been learnt, and this is what your route has done. Your route has like mangled them all up and said, right, th this is the best path. This is how I'm selecting the path. Okay? So in the case of, of AS prepin. Just go back one slide. Hmm. You mentioned the lowest origin type, EGP, better than IGP. In, IGP is internally generated stuff. Yeah. Wouldn't that be logically to be preferred? Logically, yes. But it's not. <laughs> That's why you have to watch out. Um, so then, uh, this is just an example from a uh, looking glass somewhere. I looked up a prefix, and what these people have decided to do is they wanted to make that particular path really long. Remember, we talk about AS path. All right. Um, so this particular case, they've changed it from what would have been four to six because they don't want people to go down that path. That's why they prepend. People try to get clever and put 75 or whatever the case is. True story. Um, if, if you do more than three and it doesn't work, it's not going to work. Because remember that local preference works um, as, 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 the, as the selecting um, as number two, right? So if you choose that you want to send something to me via that particular link. So let's say we have two links and you want to send it down that link. I can prepend this link as much as I want. And I can say, uh, this, I want to make this so long. You know, it, it, it mustn't get to me. And, I, and you're saying, oh, but it's the cheapest link for me. Local preference, that side, 200, 100 this way. It'll always go that way, regardless of how many times you prepend. So in this example, um, you can see there's two available, uh, well, there were 28. But in this particular case, six hops, two hops. The local preference is the same. So when it came to, they were both equal length, prefix length, and they were both, um, had the same, a, um, sorry, both the same local preference. AS path is much shorter there. Boom, send it out of that route there. Okay. And that was that one. Thank you. Questions? No, good. Maybe Hang on. Yes. No. Yes, you'll need to um, peer in each of the separate locations. So an exchange point is, um, in the case of, and well, Terraco is, is single site, uh, NAP Africa is single site, and it is specific to the regions. When it comes to um, InkZA, it is specific to the region. So you will have access to other people within the region uh, connecting to the exchange point, but not to other regions. And um, installment number four, if you want, <laughs> is um, why traffic needs to be kept local and you should be, ex uh, you should be peering locally um, instead of doing what's called remote peering. Over the 
And I'm not saying that it's right or wrong to do that. Well, I'm saying that if you choose to do it, send your aggregate as well. Yes. All right. So whenever you choose to de-aggregate your roots and to make the routing table even bigger, send your, send, send your aggregate root as well. All right. So if you have a slash 20 and you're sending out slash 21s, send your slash 20 as well. All right. But that, that is, that, that's, a, that's a good thing. Um, and, uh, you know, in KZN, we have the KZN NOG, which has its own AS. We, we host CDNs on, on that AS for the local Durban guys because um, instead of all the small ISPs having to transfer all the way to Johannesburg for their Netflix traffic, um, we cash fill um, onto one uh, cash there, and then we aggregate that cash out onto the exchange. Now, um, what we do is we uh, peer with the root servers, but we, fil we filter and, and we actually uh, have all the roots in, in our router from, the, from the, um, the root server. But we only, uh, we have then have direct peering sessions with everybody add communities onto them, which uh, is in installment number five, if you want to learn about BGP communities. Um, and we then create route maps to say, if you peer with us directly, we will send those to the, to the caches and you will then be able to use the, 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 the CDNs, the caches from, from our network. Um, and there is to make sure that the, the CDNs see that as a better option rather than um, getting them from Joburg or Mombasa or somewhere like that, people send us slash 24s. You know. But it should be a separate root filter, so you shouldn't send the slash 24s to, to everybody, but also send the aggregates. Yes. Plan. All right. <laughs>